Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back to the Extreme Hangout. Fantastic to have you all joining us. Um, another extraordinary panel, and actually the one I think I've probably been looking forward to the most. We at Extreme International are, of course, a sports business, and it has taken us through being in this wonderful world of extreme and adventure sports, that connection, we couldn't extract ourselves from our relationship with nature. Um, and we've brought together a fantastic group of panelists for you to tell you about their stories and how sport and their love of the environment and their passion and their work that they're doing in it uh, is also super interconnected um, and hopefully inspire all of you guys as well um, uh, out there to uh, get involved and use your love of sports and adventure um, and see what journey that takes you on as well. So I'm gonna hand over to my fabulous friend, uh, Dan, who works um, at the Blue Marine Foundation, an organization incredibly close to my heart and I'm deeply proud of my links with. Um, he is going to uh, lead our panelists uh, here today, but let's put our hands together and the warmest welcome to all of you and such huge appreciation and gratitude for you being here with us today. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Amber and Al and Extreme. This is this is truly beautiful to, to be here um, and a welcome um, relief from from the blue zone. Um, this panel is very kind of close to my heart. Um, I my family used to take me to the beach when I was a kid, and they'd sort of have to bribe me to get out of the sea. Um, the sea was a, a huge part of my life when I was young. Um, my father sailed around the world and for 15 years and lived in Galapagos and the Tuamotus and my whole childhood was, you know, learning about what he'd done and his, the boats. He didn't really talk about it much, but he had a lot of beautiful shells and um, he didn't really want us to become sailors because he thought we'd leave and we'd never see us. Um, but I sort of circumnavigated that and got very heavily into surfing as a kid. Um, and I sort of have been heavily into surfing ever since. And I think, you know, when, you, when you're young and you're surfing, like your, your whole focus is on waves and catching the biggest waves and the best waves. And that's what you're, you're chasing and you're, you're looking for. And then over time, it was like, I started getting really drawn to just solitude and being alone in, 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 in places without many people. And the kind of quality of the waves began to recede in important importance and what became really interesting to me was all of the other things around the marine life the different um habitats like kelp and seagrass um and the fish and i sort of got started to get heavily into free diving i was living uh in an island chain off the north coast of scotland called the orkneys and um yeah, I, got, I was free diving whenever the surf was surf was bad, and um, yeah, I sort of realised that it was a it was a intact marine ecosystem like I hadn't really seen anywhere else in the UK, and there were lots of fish and big fish, and the whole place was alive, and it sort of left me with a really powerful conviction that that was how I wanted to spend my time. You know, I wanted to spend my time trying to bring that back and that sort of led me after you know on a slightly circuitous route into working in conservation which i've been doing for almost 10 years now um and i work for the blue marine foundation we correct uh, create marine protected areas we restore marine habitat um there's about 50 of us now working in about 45 different conservation projects all over the world and i'm really proud of the organization i love what we do i love the people especially the the young people um, from all over the place who, who, you know, who are getting into conservation at a much younger age than I did, and it's going to be amazing to see what they do and how they go on and and, sh and shape the future. But this panel isn't really about me; it's about these panelists, and I'll pass over to each of them in turn to introduce themselves, and then we'll go to some questions and probably go to some questions from the audience at the end. So, Kevin, would you like to go first? Okay, hello, my name is Kevin Umtai and I'm a climate activist and also environmentalist based in Kenya in a place called Soy. Yeah. Yeah. 
Hi, everyone. I'm Vassar Seidel. I co-lead a digital media nonprofit called The Oxygen Project. Uh, we run environmental campaigns. We do impact campaigns. One of them is to get a moratorium and prevent deep seabed mining from going forward in the next year, which would be a new extractive industry uh, open in our international waters, which is over half of the entire Earth's surface. Um, and we also do activist trainings and we do environmental literacy. Uh, I'm based in Los Angeles and I'm just excited to be here with you guys today. Um, hi, my name is Sam Taylor. Um, I'm also from Kenya um, and I, slightly in the reverse to Dan, I w I've been involved in, in conservation for a long time and that has led me into adventure and adventure sport um, rather than the other way around. Um, Essentially, my background is in protected area management, specifically um, initially rhino and species protection. Um, but what our, my main focus is, on, is now is on, on uh, rangers, rangers welfare, and developing an understanding of rangers as an industry. Um, these are, I, I heard someone quite eloquently put it the other day, that we're in a a war against climate change and our allies are the rainforests and the savannas and what have you. And if that's the case, the rangers are essentially the, the foot soldiers. Um, and it's to me quite, quite shocking that it doesn't exist as an industry. Um, the welfare standards are appalling, but um, also um, I believe there's uh, more registered hairdressers in the UK than there are rangers on the entire planet. Now these, these are the guys who are protecting the areas that are going to ultimately save humankind. So um, that was a big part of getting into this. And um, what some of the ways we've done this is take part in, in extreme endurance events and expeditions all over the world on horseback, climbing mountains, uh, running ultramarathons through the desert. And, and that's been um, a means and a platform where we could not only raise money for rangers' welfare, but also a platform to tell their story um, and, and, and get some recognition for them. Um, so yeah, that's, that's me. Hi everyone, my name is Sierra Quittiquit. I am a professional extreme skier and a climate activist. Um, I've been communicating around climate for almost 20 years. My first foray was myspace.com slash skiers against global warming. Um, I'm now the CEO and founder of Time for Better, a climate communications agency, and I co-lead a nonprofit organization called Plastic Free Fridays. I think my intimacy with the snowpack, since I was a very, very young child, um, allowed me to realize, alongside my community, the impacts of climate change very, very early, and so my community that's not only dependent on snowfall for our fun, but also our livelihoods has been devastated by climate change and will continue to be devastated by climate change. So I'm, I'm very much feeling the urgency of this critical decade and I'm here to lead with an open heart and an optimistic perspective because it's been scientifically proven that hope and optimism will lead us towards collective action. Uh, hi, I'm Louis Cole. I guess I'd call myself a filmmaker, adventure filmmaker. I've been making YouTube videos for the last 10 years. And it's been travel focused, but along, my, along that journey of just traveling the world, seeing different cultures, being out in nature, it ties really intrinsically in with caring about the world, caring about what's around us, and feeling uh, an excitement to be able to share my experiences and also challenge people to look at how they view the world and how we can uh, be a big part of fighting a lot of injustices and looking after the planet that we live in. And yeah, I'll, I'll stop there. And Vasa, we were chatting before, and you were saying, like, you know, as a, as a kid, you, like, your your family sort of led you into a lot of these 
um, pursuits that you do in relation to the water, like fly fishing and surfing and that kind of stuff. It'd be great to elaborate on that. And I also want to hear, you know, through that, how it's going in the fight against deep sea mining. Um, I've seen a lot of good stuff going on, you know, a moratorium being declared by France. And yeah, it'd be great to hear more about that. We'll double mic. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. So yeah, we were talking about before of how I really fell in love with nature and how that led me to the work I do now in climate and specifically around the deep sea. So ever since I could walk, my dad had me on a pair of skis. It's his passionate passion and I'm so grateful to him because it's my passion as well. Uh, and then my grandfather had me as soon as I could walk in the streams with him learning how to fly fish. And I've been doing outdoor sports, anything I can stand on or strap to my feet or go and do, um, I find joy in, especially being outdoors. In my later years, I learned, I, I was born and raised in Atlanta, Georgia, so we were a little bit landlocked. And when I graduated from high school, I said, I want to go learn to sail. My grandfather is a big time sailor, won the World Cup, um, World Cup, uh, anyways, uh, America's Cup. And I said, I want to go learn a sail. So I went down to the BVIs, lived on a boat, got my captain's license and, and sailed for, for the summer there and then went to college. Uh, and then... More recently, I decided uh, a few years ago I wanted to learn to surf, and I fell in love with the ocean. I've always gravitated towards being in bodies of water, always gravitated towards being in the ocean, which I fi find now that that's actually scientific for grounding, and you have an ion exchange from your body to the planet uh, and body to the water, and so that's probably why all of us gravitate to those areas. Uh, because we need to recharge our bodies physically uh, for our health and for our well-being um, to nature. And we're probably indoors way too much. So I now skate, I surf, um, I do, like I said, anything I, I can do with my body outdoors. And this has really not only been, I guess, the impetus to me kind of having this flip of the switch when I had learned about deep sea mining to me being at uh, Madrid COP, which was the Oceans COP, and finding out that the world was, at that time, just about to pass regulations that would launch a new extractive industry in our global commons. And do not mistake, if you've heard greenwashing, do not mistake this for a green solution. It will absolutely be devastating, exacerbate climate change. It's our largest carbon sinks. It will exacerbate biodiversity loss, and it could potentially have effects that would even stop our currents from flowing eventually as we are completely destabilizing the fundamental building block to ocean health and climate health and the world. So I can go on a soapbox for a long time about deep sea mining, and if you'd like to learn more, please find me after. But just to say that nature plays an integral role, not only in inspiring us to do the work in climate, um, but also sustaining us. So I find the ocean, I find all of these different sports is really what keeps me re-energized, especially at COP when you're hearing um, all the stats and figures and you're seeing the tensions and we're here today in Egypt and you see the microcosms of running out of water and of it being extremely hot and, you know, other issues that are very present in front of us uh, at this COP. And you realize that in order to keep going, you need these things that re-energize you. So that's my long but also short answer. <laughs> Thanks, Vasa. Um, Kevin, it would be great to hear more about your journey into activism what motivated you to start doing it but also what you do and 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 how it's going okay yeah thank you very much so for me yeah it started uh, because i live in a village where kind of these people doesn't understand what is climate change so you have been fine most of them they have been thinking climate change is a curse or it's not real so 
I've been the one organizing most of the Friday for Future in my country. And living in a village, it was very difficult to create awareness about climate change. So I had to look for something which is special and something which my community love. And because me being fan of watching football, I was playing like, uh, rugby the time I was in college. And it came up, I say, let me start something. And the time, because I was able to attend last year COP, and uh, watching Forest Green, one of the greenest club around the world, the time I was returning back home on 29 December, I organized an environmental tournament. And it was a kind of a two days event where we had a lot of people were able to come, but not that much. And after that event, because it was try creating awareness about climate change in my community, uh, this year during Earth Day, I organized another event which was a week environmental tournament, a week. And uh, more than 32 teams, they were able to show up. 2,000 people were able to show up, including politicians, because this year we had like general election. And I decided to use that platform to create awareness about climate change. And I'm very happy because one of the politicians who was running is say, Kevin, please, can you come and write for me a manifesto about climate change? And it was a kind of thing which I was able to, to meet new people. And through that, we were able to select ambassador and more people because having 2,000 people attending March every day and watching and our aim was before March, you need to talk to them about climate change. We were planting with them trees and we were trying to educate them more about climate change. And through that, that's the reason why I say I need to have this environmental tournament every year. Because living in a community where most of my people in my community loving watching, especially English Premier League, Arsenal, Manchester, all of that. So I started to use that. Let me use this opportunity to create an awareness about climate change. And I'm very happy because through that, you are able also to run like different initiative, environmental school tour, which I've been doing currently before I came to COP. I had to, to finish my 16th school. And around 7,000 kids they have been able to benefit, 500 uh, teacher, and uh, not only school, but hospital, because I wanted to create awareness, not only in school, but in police station, in hospital, because we have been trying to use strike, but strike doesn't work in my community, because when you call yourself, you are an activist, especially in our country, Kenya, it's like a rebel. So you had to come up with another, maybe you call yourself a climate champion or other things. So that's the thing I've been using in my community, and it went very well because Forest Green were able to retweet one of my posts in social media. I say, wow, I think this is my achievement. And... Uh, Having many politicians attending one of my events, I say, I think now I'm able to conquer them. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. More power to you. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, Sam, we were chatting before about some of the stuff that you've done to raise money for, for rangers, including um, climbing Everest. <laughs> um, it'd be great to hear not, not just about that you know massive achievement, but sort of how you have used adventure sports to support that community and how it's going you know the sort of adversity that's faced you know i think it's a massively underrepresented under talked about group of people and as you say you know that it's almost like the front lines and they're the custodians and and it yeah as you say it's like it's it's a pretty um intense environment for them so it'd be, it'd be great to hear more about about that uh, um well, yeah, yeah, absolutely right. I mean, adversity is what we're trying to demonstrate. Um, I'm terrified of heights. I've got crippling vertigo. So um, <laughs> one, of the, one of the concept of doing extreme sports and encouraging other, other people to get involved in them is it, to a certain degree about demonstrating solidarity with, with what these guys on the ground are doing. Um, you know, the statistics behind wildlife rangers particularly um, globally is that there's one killed in the line of duty every three days um, every two days there's there's one injured to an extent where they can't work again the you know the, the statistics are appalling um, and so one of the the sort of means to do this is to is to put yourself through a little bit of hardship demonstrate solidarity 
Um, I'm afraid I'm appalling at, at social media, but but one one thing you know these expeditions have done is is encourage people to to um, get out and, and amongst um, the wilderness. Um, you know, perhaps some of the sort of apathy and why we're sort of right on the precipice right now with with um, saving the planet fundamentally is is a lot of young people haven't got out there and seen it. You know, climb mountains, ridden across Patagonia, run through jungles, or whatever it is. You don't, you don't have to hurt yourself doing it. But um, you know, if 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 all the kids got off their phones and got out and looked around, them, that that this, we might not be in the panic we are now. It's um, and it's an amazing means, sport and adventure. It's an amazing means to get young people out there and appreciating what's around them, and then understanding that it's disappearing very, very quickly. Um, so yeah, the the sport's been very pertinent in in many regards and links directly back to to the rangers. It's very easy to go to these wilderness areas and and find these guys who are on the ground, and um, you're you're in extreme situations. What you realise is these guys are in extreme situations every day. But perhaps for the most selfless job of all is is trying to keep it all alive. So um, that's that's the story we're trying to tell and the awareness we're trying to create. Thanks, Herman. Um, and Louis, you you use social media in a really positive way to connect people with the natural world, and your you translate your own adventures for the benefit of, of millions of people. How how did you kind of fall into doing that, and and what do you see? What's the value of that medium to sort of yeah to connect people with nature again, and to to I guess inspire them to care about it and protect it and all of the things that we're talking about. Yeah, I mean, just off the back of what you were sharing, I was in Kenya last year working with the Sheldrick Foundation, and they showed us their rangers. We went to the ranger camp, and and I we did I did a post just with this absolute. Uh, I was in awe and a gratitude of the work they were doing, and I did a post, and it was like one of the there, we did a bunch of posts like with elephants and stuff, but. That was one of the posts which had the it resonated most with my audience, and they were commenting on that photo and just just sharing a bit of what the, the work they were doing there. So I just wanted to uh, thank you for the work you're doing because it's so critical. And if there's any way afterwards we could chat about supporting what you're doing, I'd love to. Um, but yeah, I mean, going back to your question, yeah, I I kind of stumbled into the whole social media thing. I think it was just good timing that it was in the rise of the early days of YouTube really exploding and a new medium, a new platform on the internet. And obviously there's lots of different platforms now. Um, but I've just found it to be such an amazing, and and even, you know, the more, the you know, global south and developing countries uh, are getting access to high, higher speed internet and devices, it's becoming uh, an even more democratic kind of way of sharing, you know, back in the day, traditional media, it's, there's so many, barriers to entry to get messages out there to get your voice out there and uh, I'm just so excited uh, about being able to use a platform to share stories uh, I remember really early on I uh, again uh, just on the as we've got two other people from Kenya here like I was it was an, a project so I was in Kenya and I was meeting uh, some street kids that had uh, moved into a home and they were kind of it was work, working with this other organization and I was like look the data to upload a video to YouTube wouldn't be that expensive. So I got one of the kids to share his story on my video, uh, just share about his life a little bit. And um, my audience, and I was doing daily videos at the time. So for a long time, I did every single day. It was kind of brutal, but I did every single day, filmed my day, uploaded that night, started again the next day, just relentlessly. And uh, which I don't want to do now, but so I uploaded the video that night and it was thousands of comments replying to this kid. His name is Teddy. And they were like, oh my gosh, like tell Teddy. Because he, he just said something really profound. He was, uh, I can't remember the exact words he used, but it was like a really, he was, oh, he said something about being proud of himself. And it was such a powerful thing for ki kids from the UK, the US, like the Western world, who often struggle with self-esteem. They were like really touched. Anyway, the next day I showed him the comments and he was like, I get really blown away and I and, and I then said oh if you got anything to say back and he is this really interesting back and uh, forth on my videos between my audience and him 
And then at the end of the uh, at the end of the trip, I said, "Look, why don't you set up a YouTube channel, um, and and I'll get everyone to subscribe." And like ten thousand people went over and subscribed to his YouTube channel. Unfortunately, they didn't have the infrastructure or funds or whatever to ha to maintain it. But I th I, th I think there's something in that story of like there's this potential to share stories from around the world from people experiencing uh, different lives, and I think there's that fascination and excitement that we are this global community and tying it back in with kind of climate change activism. Um, I think like someone was saying, like the more you get out there and explore the world uh, and uh, encourage young people to do that, I think there's inevitably gonna be this excitement and passion to protect it. And I think, uh, yeah, I think it's only, it, it's not slowing down. I think this ability to create content, to share content, to consume content, obviously, it, sometimes it's a bit too much and we do need to encourage people to get off their phones and go outside but i think there is uh, such power in it and su such a powerful medium to share stories and yeah yeah that's that it's incredible like what you know that i guess we're all sort of guinea pigs in in the use of social media and we're sort of learning and i, I guess it has you know f for some of us who didn't grow up with it, it, it you know it can be quite daunting but it the the sort of use of it as a global environmental tool to like inform people you know that's amazing it's cool to meet someone on the on the forefront of that and see the the positivity of it i guess that's that's super cool um and sierra you you talked a little about the mountains and the climate change sort of indicators that you see and how your you know your your, your life as an extreme skier takes you into that climate and how it, you know it's it's sort of everything to you and as, as an ocean person i'm i'm acutely aware to the the sort of indicators of that that i see and you know i free dive a lot at home and i'll i'll be out there for an hour and i'll see like two fish you know and it's kind of sad i live in like a really depleted ecosystem in the uk um what are some of the things you see and what's being done in the skiing community to address them like i know there's a load of amazing activist groups and it'd be great to hear more about your work and and what you're trying to achieve yeah i came into the um snow sports world as a professional uh, over a decade ago as a young gun and very very excited to make my my stake on the world as a professional athlete and uh, right as that was happening, we really experienced three winters right in a row um, with devastating snowfall. And that led to a huge sort of economic collapse of, of my industry. And, you know, that's when I went through my personal transition from what I like to call ego to eco, understanding that it maybe wasn't about what I could extract from the industry, it was maybe how I could help and use this platform. And from there, I teamed up with Protect Our Winters, which is an amazing global organization um, working on climate change advocacy. They've been really influential on policy work in the United States. Um, they take outdoor-minded individuals and professional athletes to lobby with their representatives. So I was lobbying with some of my leaders in DC um, for the Inflation Reduction Act, the IRA. For those of you that don't know, this is the largest piece of legislation ever passed in United States history. It's not a perfect piece of legislation, but it put nearly $400, $400 billion towards climate action, um, which is huge for in the United States. So um, you know that's an example of how athletes being filtered by well-organized NGOs can create really influential action. Um, and as because you mentioned uh, free diving, I have also been incredibly influenced by the ocean. Uh, every professional skier actually wishes they were a surfer. Um, so whenever the snow melts, I, I head off to the ocean somewhere and I had the chance a few years ago to visit uh, my ancestral homeland of the Philippines and I was so excited to dive and I, I located on site to some of the best diving in the world. I, I stuck my head underwater and I was so confused because there was nothing there, nothing at all. 
and I thought that maybe I'd been, been brought to the wrong location, and then it was made clear to me that it was just dead, all of it, and it was dead all throughout the Philippines, and then I started to look on maps globally of what's happening to the ocean, and I started to think, wow, this isn't just the crisis of the mountains, it's a crisis of the ocean, and of course a global crisis. Um, but to end on a positive, more hopeful note, obviously there's um, a lot of incredible technology, um, people are growing corals, and here in Egypt, the Red Sea is actually being declared a UNEP International Hope Site. This right here, just steps away from this location, is the healthiest, most resilient underwater life in the world. If all the coral in the world were to bleach, this would be the last living coral, and that's due to the highest salination, and there's amazing organizations like HEPCA working locally to protect it, and, and this just makes me so, so thrilled to get to stick my head underwater here and see rainbows of corals and fish and health, and, and that's what keeps me personally going as an activist. That's amazing. Um, yeah, and I, I think... For, for everyone here you know the chance to sort of dip your head in 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 the sea before before going into the blue zone or or going into your agenda for the day is you know it's re it's just incredibly uplifting and really good for your physical and mental health to be around intact habitats with lots of life and you know that's proved that's scientifically proven across the board but it'd be good to explore that topic just a little bit like i you know as like surfing is something that's what well, I've always come back to since I was, you know, a, a little kid. And it's something that's kept me like semi healthy um, throughout my life. And it kind of provides this, I think, a really healthy state of mind. You know, it's I think when I was young for a bit, it was like an escape. And then it was like, hold on, this isn't an escape at all. It's like a coming into something much bigger than you. And it's that's what's so incredible about it. And I mean, it, I guess all of us, uh, you know, that that sort of link between physical health and planetary health um, is quite strong. It'd be great. It would be great to just explore that and, and think more about and, and learn more from some of you about some of the stuff, you know, you've, you've done physically and how that, I guess, challenge sort of helps to meet the challenge of what we're dealing with on a planetary scale. Um, Sam, do you want to start on, on that <laughs> as i know you well, I, I mean sierra talking about the sea it's made me want to learn how to swim <laughs> um no uh, it, it, you're absolutely right that, you, that challenging yourself physically is is so good for you um and getting out and amongst and as i say we're, we're talking about people who are doing extreme very challenging sports um having young people who are able to challenge themselves sets them up in a, in a pretty good mindset. Um, you know, we are, as a human race, quite frankly, facing the biggest challenge in, you know, that humanity's ever faced. It's going to take some resilient people um, to deal with this and, and, and to be optimistic. And the optimism is, is also really important. Um, so, yeah, the, you know, I, this, earlier this year, um, I have two daughters. I, I decided to learn how to ride a horse because they're obsessed with horses. So we we took on um, the the longest endurance horse race or the, or the hardest endurance horse race in the world across Patagonia. Um, I, I spent 10 days in, in sheer terror, completely out of control, um, but came through it feeling positive and optimistic. And, and you know, that, that these are important things for the self. And as I said, with, with everything that we're facing right now, we need to be optimistic, we need to be positive, and we also need to be resilient. And uh, this this adventure sport will will bring that out in people. It'll it'll help them in in many ways that way. Yeah. Do you do you feel similar to that? Do you feel like all of these these different things that you do that keep you healthy? You know, do you think that sort of inspires you to to push for planetary health and to fight things like deep sea mining. Yeah, I think it's it's inspiration, but it's also lessons learned. So out in the natural world, I feel like has been one of my best teachers uh, to understanding what to do next. 
because I don't know if you guys have felt this way, but I definitely have where you look at this issue so massive in scale and consider what the F am I going to do about this? And then once you, you know, don't like center yourself so much in, in such a big issue and you turn towards nature, you get out of nature, you're doing a sport or maybe you just go take a walk through nature and you quiet yourself down. There's a lot to learn and you can start there and I promise you, you'll find what to do. So I think for me, it's been the lessons learned, especially when I'm sitting out on a surfboard. If you don't know how to surf, you can just go sit on a surfboard in the water or you can also learn um, or just go swim or snorkel. And in that process, you get inspired and you you learn what you need to do to take physical action in this space. Uh, and then I also think it's the I love how you brought horses into this because there is also the intersection of animals and extreme sports and just in, in nature and how you can also learn from those experiences as well as well. My mom to bring her in now that I'm bringing all my family members in, she uh, played polo until um, my dad, until she had me. Um, and my dad was very nervous about having kids that my, my mom already had my brother and her playing um, an extreme, extreme sport of polo. So she had, us on horses since I, I don't even think we could walk at that time. Um, and I learned from horses about not having fear because that's what people tell you the first time you get on a horse. They can sense your fear. They can sense your emotions. So if you don't want to get bucked off, then don't don't be fearful. And there's so many lessons like that that you can take when you come into spaces like COP or you find yourself, you know, uh, I was guess I was 24 at the time deciding I was going to run a campaign on deep sea mining, you know, with imposter syndrome. Who who the hell do I think I am to, you know, be doing something like this? But lessons that you can learn from nature and realize that, you know, you you have agency and nature can empower you to empower yourself. So sorry, these flies, <laughs> they're good, too. Um, I appreciate them. Um, but. Yeah, so that, that would be my long-winded answer. I've got something I'd love to add. Yeah. Um, so about six years ago, I watched a documentary, Cowspiracy, which kind of blew my mind uh, about the environmental impact that we all now know of the, the meat and dairy industry. And uh, it was such a turning point in my life, and it ties into what you were asking about, kind of physical endurance and doing uh, some of these big kind of uh, action sport activities. You know, I'd always thought this myth of, you know, you need animal protein to be strong to be able to do sports. There's a new documentary, actually, if people haven't watched it, called um, Game Changers, which is kind of shows not only can you survive, but thrive and actually compete better on a plant-based diet. And I kind of put this to the test. Um, I think it's about three or four years ago. We cycled from London to North Africa to Morocco. Zero training. I don't know why I threw myself in with no training, but I did it on a recumbent bicycle, you know, the ones when you're like sitting down like this. And it's like 2,000 miles. We're doing like 100 miles a day. First three days were hell. I was just like my body was destroyed. But then amazingly, it just adapted, which again, I think just shows how resilient and adaptable the human body is. But not only, and so I did the whole thing. And I said at the beginning of my video series, I made a video series on my YouTube channel about it, but that I wanted to prove that I could do this on a vegan diet. And again, not just survive, but thrive doing it. And uh, yeah, turns out, not only did I complete it, but I was pretty, I was the only one that technically did it out of 20 of us to complete the whole thing. And some of the days I was like leading the, leading the pack. And it was just like so amazing to me that I could, you know, do something uh, extreme. We were raising money for a youth charity in London at the time, get to show the planet that, you know, we're protecting and to show that, you know, I can do something like this, uh, doing something for the planet as well, just with a simple choice of deciding not to eat meat and dairy in my life. So for me, that was like, it kind of like crossed over a few of the things that I really am passionate about. And I think that was uh, something I loved to be able to share that journey with my audience as well and inspire people. And I've met people since that have kind of watched my videos, although I'm not like a preachy vegan, uh, I try not to be, 
uh, it was people have like, wow, that really amazed me, and I've I've decided also, you know, to stop eating meat and dairy for the planet, and yeah, it's cool. Well, you're looking pretty well for it. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Never felt healthier and stronger. Yeah, that's that, that's amazing to hear. Um, and you know, like I'd rather go and surf like waves that people would think of as really scary and dangerous and horrible than do what you do. So I mean, I think it takes a lot of bravery to sort of to put yourself out there. Have you, have, have you found that has that been a journey for you, like? you know putting yourself out in the public eye and yeah i mean i think you learn to get a bit resilient to comments because i think unfortunately social media platforms kind of lend themselves to kind of trolls and uh people uh keyboard warriors like giving their opinions on everything every single thing you do and i think you know i i chose to put my life out there and it you know you you're kind of opening yourself to getting thousands of comments that just you, it's kind of unhealthy to even read them all, to be honest. But uh, I think I also am an optimist and r feel really hopeful. So I, f I try not to get too dragged down into the negativity. And, you know, there's a lot of stuff nowadays. People feel scared to post anything because of cancel culture. And like, oh, you're going to say the wrong thing. But uh, I think overall, uh, even with all of that, I think it's it's it can be this beautiful space. And you can kind of, uh, you can kind of curate and nurture an audience which uh, are more caring and hopeful and believe in good things in the world so that's what we try and try and do Sierra would you would you like to come in on on that that sort of link between physical health and I guess the like the what the mountains have taught you and and like given you in terms of health and um I think that, yeah there's sort of a adrenaline aspect to it too isn't it like if you're if you're sort of used to stepping outside your comfort zone like a lot of these conversations that we're we're having this week are outside of people's comfort zones like these are hard conversations and yeah it'd be great to hear more about your journey and and and, and those links yeah i think athletes are definitely conditioned to do hard things and uh anybody who's an activist or organizer knows you know or involved in the climate movement in any ways knows that this is this is a very difficult space there's not one clear answer and we need to be incredibly collaborative and, and intelligent, um, and we need leadership with a big open heart. And I think I really take my um, my ski community with me everywhere in the mountains. Um, when you're going out in the backcountry for a mission, maybe you're going to climb six, seven, eight thousand feet that day, and you've got a team with you. There's a level of organization and preparation that goes into that day if um if your hot water is not perfectly up to temperature and the temperature drops and you get cold you risk hypothermia if a team member breaks its leg and you don't have the proper equipment to get them out of the back country you're risking people's life and so there's a level of of teamwork and we're all in this together that happens in the ski community and then as you move globally as a skier there's a level of care and community. I know that if I, as a skier, show up in the Alps or in Japan or any ski community around the world, that I'll be met immediately with open arms of like, what do you need? You forgot this, you've got it, no problem. And when they're in my hometown, that hospitality is returned. And I think that that's the kind of collaboration we need in this climate movement because ultimately, we're all in this mission together as global citizens. And I'm so happy to hear that we have a voice from the Global South here, Kevin. And I love what you're doing of bringing sport to your community through climate change. And one of the things that's really challenging about the sport of skiing is the barrier to entry. I'm not somebody that grew up with a lot of privilege, but my parents always were able to figure it out to get me a pair of hand-me-down skis. And, you know, I grew up in a one-bedroom condo, smashed in with th all three of my brothers. And skiing was ultimately the thing that um, helped me improve my quality of life. And I think for a lot of young kids, sport can, can be that, not just to improve their quality of, of life professionally, but through the day to day. And so one thing that I like to think about as an athlete is, um, and a climate activist is, is how do we lift everybody up as we move through this space so um yeah i would just love to chat with you kevin at some point how we can support you and your your organization and what you're doing 
Yeah, Kevin, do you want to come in? I mean, yeah, what what's the future of your organization and what what if you could give a message to other young people in a similar position who could emulate your journey, what would that be? Okay, yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, I think for me what I can say, yeah, you know, to start the project and the environmental tournament was one of the most expensive projects I've ever organized in my community because it was not easy. You need to come up with a team, with the staff where they can support you, and it was not easy for me. But what I learned through my my activism and through my process is that sometimes for me, I don't depend mostly in resources because you may depend on someone to give you something and then they end up drop because I had to write like a proposal and to send to a hundred company in my Kenya, but not even one company was able to reply to my proposal. <laughs> it was not easy, but I ended up organizing because I saw that this is the only opportunity for me to unite my community. And living in a community where people mostly they are not illiterate, most of them doesn't understand what is climate change. I had to organize the tournament. And it was one of the best things I think my community up to now they are still remember. And it was like a, a risk. And also it was like most of the politician people in my community didn't believe they were saying, Kevin, you want to stand in one of the seats to be member of parliament or because they think when you want to do something in the in our community, it's like you want something to return back because most of the, our politicians that have been using different types of event for them to be elected to be the in their seats to represent my community. But for me, I say, no, I am doing it because I want my community to be at one of the best places. It is because experience, invasion locusts in my community, experience drought, I wanted to start things to, not only to unite youth, but to unite all people in my community. That's why I say I need to go with this environmental tournament in my community. And it was not easy. And I was able to get, I think, most of the courage from one of the best player, Cristiano Ronaldo, because I remember sometimes back, I think it was this year, he was able to remove, I don't want to mention the company. I think for me, water is better. And it was that company was able to have a loss of some billion because it's one of the politics company around the world. And that's why I say if you can try to use this like this celebrity to push about climate change, I think it's a good thing. That's why I think most of you know Louis Hamilton is one of the best, I think, Ferrari guy. The time I was in UK, I was able to go to watch one of the extreme, I think plus forty four to see how they have been using a, a electric car to do their thing. And uh, this year, the, before I came to COP, I think most of you know Jakaris, he was to be here. So he DM me, I think, on Instagram, Kevin, how are you? I want to work with you with, on a project. I say, yeah, for me, I'm not because it's the first time for this guy to DM me on, on Instagram and say, Louis Amin Louis, Louis team, they are working on a documentary featuring different youth around the world and you have been one of the chosen ones to work on this documentary. And it's going to be, I think you're from Kenya, it was about, because in 2019 I was running a campaign Save Nairobi National Park. And they say they want to feature me on one of their documentary which was Save Nairobi National Park. I was able to shoot the video before I came to COP, and I think their team was to be here in the blue zone, but they were not able to be given a chance to set up their pavilion. So I think they said they are going to showcase the video in London next year. And seeing how these people have been trying to influence and also to to take and also to get into this field of climate activism and also try to save, I think that's a good thing because for us we need all people, because you have been seeing how climate change has been affecting not only uh, agriculture, but in different ways. Talking about hospital, talking about everything is being affected by climate change. And as I'm talking now, you find how around the world they are being affected by climate change. Because you may not see, but someone who is in Kenya right now, Kenya is one of the countries which are experiencing the impact of climate change. If you can go there and visit like uh, Savo National Park, elephants are dying. 
most of the park, even the time I was in Nairobi, I was very shocked in one of the, our best unique Nairobi National Park because it's a unique, it's the only national park in the city with these big four animals. Seeing the number decreasing also eager me to, to fight in this field because it is not easy to be a full time in this field of climate activism. That's why for me it's a challenge and also I'm I'm trying to push it here. Amazing. There are so many good points in there. Thanks, Kevin. Um I think we've got time for some questions from the audience. Um do you wanna Uh, thank you all so much. You, uh, almost all of you, I think, have spoken about courage at different points and uh, pushing your own personal boundaries. Um, and uh, I just wondered, I'd love to hear from all of you just quickly about the actions that you would encourage the young audience listening around the world uh, to maybe take that extra step and what uh, how, how they can just dig that little deeper um, uh, and challenge themselves sort of one step at a time. Um, not only in their, their sport, their own physical, mental health and well-being, but how that can also reflect uh, for the planet um, and that well-being too. Yeah, um, I would, I guess, st you know, this is a movement which is often feels very heavy and tough and, you know, we're in a catastrophe, so it's hard not to be negative. But I think I would encourage to to stay hopeful, to know that we're in this fight together. And there's some simple steps that you can start taking. Obviously, there's like a million steps we can take, but the simple steps you can start taking to to live a better life for the planet. I think there's also, um, you know, just get out there, see the world. I think a lot of what we've been talking about is uh, ex exploration, adventure. And I think that will stoke the fire of feeling this oneness with the planet, feeling this uh, excitement to be part of this movement to, to protect it. Uh, and, uh, and, of, and often it being like you were saying, like uh, connecting with the planet Earth thing, feeling really connected to Mother Earth uh, gives us the hope and, uh, and kind of heals us from the mental anguish and depression of, of this overwhelming uh, time we're living in. Uh, so yeah, get out there and uh, you know make the small choices in your own life that can that can impact the planet better. I, mean, I think Vassar touched on this, but the the imposter syndrome um, can be real in joining the climate movement. It's it's so overwhelming, and who am I to? And you know, I'm a high school dropout. I I, I was a model. I'm a I'm a skier. Like, but I'm I'm still stepping up every day and leading and thinking. Who can I help today? Where can I be a force? Where's my my big lever? And so I just want to tell everybody out there that you don't have to be an expert. You don't have to have a doctorate degree to join the climate movement. Everybody is welcome in this space. And as a leader, um, I try to remind myself that my work can only be as well as I am well. And so as we're working to regenerate this planet, we need to regenerate ourselves and we need to regenerate our brothers and sisters and remember that we're all interconnected in this community. And so I encourage you all to lead with a, a spirit of love and compassion, generosity and, and hope. Um, what I would say, I've seen, obviously we've all seen some very frightened young people and they're right to be frightened. Um, you know, they're concerned about their future. Uh, you talked about, you know, the courage to do things and to get out and do things beyond your comfort zone. And when you get into trouble, go breathe and get busy. And and I think that applies to all these, to, to everyone. Um, you've got to get busy. But, um, you know, get, everyone's got to get themselves together now. Um, there's urgency, yes, but, you know, there, people need to understand that there is hope, but we've got to get busy. So at the Oxygen Project, we do these uh, activism trainings. We've actually just gone through our first cohort uh, on our Spanish side. We have a Spanish team based out of South um, America that is running them in Spanish, and we're halfway through our first cohort in English. And one of the first activities we do, I don't know if this is working. Oh, here. <laughs> That's where it is. 
and one of the first activities that we do is a Venn diagram. And it's very simple. And on one side, you put your skills. Maybe you don't have the skill yet. Maybe you're working on it or you would like to have that skill. Don't get too caught up in that. And then on the other side, your passions. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have to be obviously environmental as more and more people understand that a lot of solutions are intersectional. So it can really be any passion you have that could possibly tie back to the environment. And in the middle, you can combine the two to create action steps. So you can do some that are something maybe you could do today. And the more you sit with it is maybe it's a bigger dream of something you can do in your community tomorrow or in a, in a month from now. And then you can start creating goals, alignment goals of how you want to get there. Because like we said in this question, maybe it's, it's not the biggest goal is the first thing you do, but maybe it's that small thing that would make you feel good that you know you're having an impact that you could do today and working through that. Um, so that's where I would say you can start and just know that you know you can look outward for uh, you know in inspiration, but really that empowerment and that agency lies within. So just build a community around you and um, get to work and inspire those around you along the way. Okay, yeah, I think for me what I can say, I should say activism is a process where you can get involved in many fields. This the activism field is very wide. You can be a human rights activism, food rights activism, as long as you are protecting something because the way I say climate change is interlinked with many issues. So just go there, we have social media, we have Google, which is one of the best tools we have ever had. You can go there and search, how can I get involved in this field? Yeah, and building on what Louis said as well, like taking that joy and wonder that we all feel in the natural world and channeling that into your your passion and, and your activism and, and and using that as a source of energy is definitely a good long-term strategy for, for young people. Um, but also it's kind of amazing being here in the blue zone and seeing young people from all over the planet uh, speaking up. And I think that going back to that theme of imposter syndrome and courage and like it feels really impenetrable like trying to have a voice and trying to bring your voice to this this space but what i'm seeing more and more is that's so possible for for young people right now and i'd urge i'd urge them all to just believe in themselves and believe in 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 that sort of passion and and to just push it and go for it because this is the moment if there's ever been one I just wanted to add a couple more words of encouragement as well. Firstly, that we're, none of us are perfect and it's quite hard. Sometimes you don't want to enter in something. I've spoken to other creators that are even too scared to speak out about environmental issues because they know they're not perfect and they're going to get backlash because they use the wrong products, they use plastic, you know. So I feel like firstly, no one's perfect. And I think that's part of the culture I'd love to see happen more rather than the council culture. Like, you know, call people out. Yeah, but call people, you know, into a better scenario and uh, i think and the other thing is and i think young people are doing this really well is building community building these activist groups the amount of young youth activists from around the world that are part of these little groups that they're starting and they're interacting and i think um something great about cop i don't know so much about the political side of it and all of the talking and stuff kind of it's a bit overwhelming for me but i think like the the cross pollination and sharing ideas and you know meeting really cool people doing stuff i feel like this is where you can draw together we're never going to be able to do it as an isolated island just trying to you know i have the tendency sometimes to be the lone wolf the lone ranger trying to do my thing but it's all about collaboration and community thank you um i i, I want to say thank you because this is the most encouraging thing that i've seen here at the COP. <laughs> Thank you for that. I'd also like to ask you if you know about the ecosystem restoration camps movement, because there are 55 camps around the world where people are doing ecosystem restoration, including one an hour and a half from here in, in uh, Nueva called the Habiba camp. But there are camps in Somalia, in Guatemala, in the Philippines, all over. 
And if you guys would champion this, all the kids would go to ecosystem restoration camps. I hope you will. I hope you'll go to ecosystem restoration camps and lead with example how to do that, how to, how to take charge, because we can restore soils. We can restore the hydrological cycle. We can do agroecology. We can restore forests. We can do the coastal zones and corals and, and mangroves. And in doing that, we make the communities more resilient in, in, ter in times of famine and drought and flooding. And we bring this sense of community. And that is the real thing. I think when I see what's going on in the blue zone, it's kind of scary. It seems like it's the trade show at the end of the world. And it might be a better idea for us to go plant trees, to go work together, play together, play, play and, and cook together, feed everybody, feed everyone who's hungry. We can do that. And I, I talked with the WF World Food Program, WFP, and they said even if all the money that has been pledged were given to them, they could only feed half of the people who need it. So if we work with local communities to build central kitchens and creator spaces and cultural stages, then all the people can feed themselves. We can have the World Food Program send the money to the communities themselves to help them build up their capacity to feed themselves. This is the kind of thing that I hope you guys will challenge, uh, champion with your celebrity and your and your courage and bring more courage to those people. Thank you. Thanks. I'll be really quick. Um, thank you for all your stories. You guys have access to some incredible places in the world. Often, can you all hear me? It's closer. Um, you all have access to some incredible landscapes across the world. You know, great diving spots here. You know, great mountains, forests. Uh, but there's the challenge of too many people in these areas in the tourism industry. I mean, this coral is mostly dead, largely because the tourism industry here. Can you speak to what your role is in conserving these spaces, and given your voice and your platforms, you know, what can you do for these areas? Do you boycott it? Are you advocates? How do you use your voice in this respect? Um, so part of the, I'm, I'm hosting the Hope House here, and part of our program offering um, was we wanted to be able to take people into the Red Sea. And so our first step was to find the local nonprofit organization here that's already doing the work here. And to connect with them. And so we have been we met with them many, many months ago and went through their protocol and understood how it is that they are managing their local systems, the capacity, and, so, and how we could be allies to them. And we went into listening mode. And so we took their educational resources like Reef Safe Sunscreen, Don't Touch the Corals, and we amplified that out to our community and asked them to amplify it out to their community of visitors coming in here. And so I think it's it's really important as activists that we are always remember to um, to pass the mic and highlight the the leaders on the ground doing the work and allow them to invite us into their their spaces because you bring up a really uh, really important point that some of us have a lot of privilege to go around the world and access all of these different places and as we're promoting them there needs to be a responsible level of of tourism so I don't have all the answers but that's one case study of how we attempted to do it right I, I'd just like to add that my my job is in protected area management my my day job um, and obviously the, these ecosystem services all these Places need to be funded, uh, you know, and that is always the the discussion. Tourism is the means to fund; it is an ecosystem service. 
Fundamentally, though, it's it's hugely flawed. It, it it's um, it's the most inefficient ecosystem service there is. We talk about eco tourism. We've tried to sort of follow the dollar. About five percent of tourism revenue when it goes through a booking agent and gets down gets down to the the protected area. Now, if you're a farmer and you put five percent of your revenue back into your land, it would collapse. Um, and this is this is why. We've got to find ways, ecosystem services beyond tourism. You know, there's the, we've been at a huge amount of discussions with uh, guys talking about biodiversity credits, carbon credits, all the, all these these ways to monetize things. But fundamentally, they've got to be efficient, and the money's got to go to the go go to where, where, where it needs to be is to protect the land. There's quite frankly, I've been quite cynical, but at the COP here, there's a lot of people here to make a lot of money, um, and. Um, we just it's going to be quite important for everyone to acknowledge that that money needs to be made to save the planet it's not being made to make some people rich and um that goes with all the ecosystem services it's a big it's a big responsibility that needs to be borne i'll just bring back up something sierra was saying earlier from the ego to eco and this extractive mindset so whether you're looking at solutions if they're still extractive that's using a mindset that's colonial based it's why we have runaway climate change in our faces today. So even as a person making decisions in your everyday, especially if you're traveling or if you're out there doing any sort of sport or if you're out there consuming and you're just moving through the world, just having a recognition in your own mindset of moving away from this extractive uh, kind of way that you move throughout the world and especially when that comes to traveling like we are here today to make sure you're in community with people who are local and this is their home and to make sure that you're not just going into a space to consume whatever you can and then leave so i think it's also just a mindset shift that both applies in this bigger scale and why we're here at cop and then on that interpersonal work as well Yeah, it's such a good question, um, and it's, it's it's a really hard answer. Um, but um, yeah, um, are there any more questions, or uh, should we um, call it a day? I mean, thank you, thank you. Oh, sorry. Uh, here you go. Come on. <laughs> Cheers. Um, it was kind of going back to what you were talking about um, earlier. I think. All of us probably here suffer a little bit from eco-anxiety. Um, and then there was the whole pandemic going on uh, where maybe some of us got a bit more anxious. Um, and I think for myself, I got like, I was already into climbing, but I got like really into climbing there. Um, but I think, my, so my question is more, how would you recommend maybe people that don't have like someone to, you know, kind of like, take them along um like how do you get into like something that improves your physical health at the same time as like environmental health like you would do with with sports and like engaging with the nature um where you are like what are some easy steps to like get into this um in the way that maybe you are Okay, yeah, maybe I can start. Yeah, for me, what I've been trying to do is, before I started the environmental uh, tournament and outdoor environmental school tour, it's not, it's not not easy because living in a community, you are alone. Most of the this like kind of a big activism they are based in Nairobi, so I had to create a group. It's just a small group, and uh, slowly by slowly, now I have more than forty. And you have been trying to encourage each other. Sometimes you may like this, you may like this, but you know, in this field, you just say, let's continue pushing because people are dying and and you can't postpone climate change. So for me, it's just, if maybe I'm low, I just, I can go maybe watch football, dance, or just going down in my social media and try to watch the comment because we have some people who are just word of encouragement, we are doing good, just keep what you are doing. So through those words, that's what I've been giving me. You are, you are good, just keep going on. Yeah, and through my mentors and everyone just in my community. Yeah. Uh, 
Um, I I had a lot of injuries um, in my sport, and my body doesn't function the same way that it used to. But I'm I'm still managing to hold on to my endorsement deals and and continue to wear the professional athlete hat. And um, my my trick has been the mind. Um, you know, my body's starting to fail a little early in life, but I can still train my mind. And I think that's something that we all have access to. And so cultivating a, a mentality that's going to take you the distance, I think, is, is really underserved in our Western modern culture. Optimism, positivity, gratitude, breathing, human connection. And, and not forgetting that we speak about nature like we're separate than it, but but we are nature. If you want to touch nature, may I touch you? Yeah. I've just touched some nature right here. You know, take your shoes off. Step step in the grass. We don't we don't need this high level entry that costs a lot of money to go out with a lot of equipment. Just just take your shoes off whenever possible. And if people look at you funny, just invite them to join you. Yeah, thanks so much, everyone. Thanks, Amber and Al, and a, a Extreme Hangout for having us. Um, and I think that's it, right? I think so. Um, that's been wonderful. Um, the only thing I would add uh, is really when you want to get into this space, when you want to look after yourself, when you want to look after the planet, just open up your front door, step out, and we're all waiting here to catch you and embrace you in our communities um, so thank you to all of you so very much. Um, it's just been marvelous. I've loved every second of it. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.